Hello, and welcome to the Allen Press webinar, Best Practices for APCs. I'm Joanna Gillette, Product Marketing Manager at Allen Press, and I'll be your host today. On your screen, you should see some general information about participating in today's webinar. I'm going to go over a few of these items very quickly before we get started. Our presenter will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. So if you do have questions, please use the chat function of WebEx to direct questions to the webinar host, which is me. We're using VoiceOver IP technology to broadcast the audio for today's webinar. So please make sure you have the volume turned up on your PC if you're having trouble hearing. VoiceOver IP quality may vary depending on network traffic. So if you are having trouble hearing the, during the webinar, please call in to listen to us over your conference line. The toll-free telephone number and participant passcode for the conference line are listed next to the green telephone icon on this slide. If you do call into the conference line, please be sure to mute your telephone. You can continue the conversation with us and your fellow, fellow attendees after the webinar using the Discussions tab of the Allen Press Facebook page. Here you can post a comment, share an idea, or ask a question. We also encourage attendees to tweet during and after the event using the hashtag APWeb25. You, uh, today, Peter Burns will share best practices for APCs. He'll discuss APCs as they relate to open access payments, focusing on relevant considerations for authors, institutions, funders, and publishers. Peter will also address author payments that do not relate to open access, such as tape charges. He'll share a few interesting case studies so you can see how other publishers manage this complex matter. Peter Burns has worked in the publishing industry for more than 20 years. He spent several years as a copy editor at such publications as Popular Mechanics and the National Law Journal. In 2003, he joined Allen Press, where he's worked as a managing editor for several years and is now a publisher managing six peer-reviewed journals. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Peter now, and don't forget to send me your questions. All right, thank you, Joanna, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I want to start with uh, just the definition of terms here. Uh, APC has been defined a couple of different ways. I'm sticking with what I think is the most common definition, article processing charges. And as Joanna said, uh, the scope of this webinar is going to include open access, and open access has its own unique characteristics that I want to cover in some degree of depth. Uh, but I don't want to restrict the webinar to the topic of open access. Uh, some of the same concepts that apply to taking open access fees will apply to other charges. So I want to uh, broaden the definition of APC for our purposes today to include any fee that could be charged to authors. So with that, let me start with a little bit about open access and the current status of uh, where are we now. One thing that I've noticed over the past few years is that the tone of the discussion around open access seems to have shifted, and it continues to shift. Uh, attending a, a meeting several years ago, it was not uncommon for publishers to express a great deal of concern about open access. Um, you know, is this a threat to our business model? Is this a threat to our existence even? Um, I think in the earliest days of open access, that was an understandable response. In the meantime, we have had to deal with some open access mandates, and we've, many of us, worked with uh, open access charges, and the tone at the most recent meetings that I've been to have been more one of acceptance and accommodation of open access. Uh, it's here, it's a part of our uh, operation, and now the question is not so much how to avoid it or prevent it, but how do we live with it and accommodate it? And even more recently, really just within the past few months, we're starting to see more and more uh, recognition that open access represents an opportunity. And I think you'll see this later in the webinar when I talk about some of the new things that are happening with regard to processing open access charges. 
So in this webinar, what I want to discuss are the, uh, the implications of open access for the four major stakeholders, the funders, the institutions, the authors, and the publishers. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges around processing open access payments. And I will also share some possible solutions to those challenges. So let's take a look at where we are currently with open access. Uh, this information comes from a report that was released earlier this year from Outsell. It shows that in 2011, open access revenue across the board was 128 million and increased 34% in 2012 to 172 million. The report from Outsell projects that it's going to continue to grow, maybe not at that same pace. It may be less than 30%, but we're still looking at continued growth for the foreseeable future. Uh, I also want to point out uh, that we don't know exactly what the long term is going to be for open access. We are uh, still waiting for the response to the White House memo that was released earlier this year where government agencies have to provide their plan for making research available open access. Certainly that will influence what happens in this marketplace. Uh, the report from Outsell also points out that the projected growth in open access is based on a most likely scenario of the funders being willing to pay for gold open access. So, you know, still long-term things are have yet to really settle. Uh, this is an emerging model of doing business, and we're still trying to figure out where it's going. But in the meantime, it certainly does look like open access is here, and it's something that we have to accommodate. So with that in mind, I want to first talk about what are the implications of open access for the major stakeholders in the process. So first, let's take a look at funders. And I should mention that quite a bit of the information in the next few slides comes from a report from the Research Information Network that was released in October 2012. This report is titled The Potential Role for Intermediaries in Managing the Payment of Open Access Article Processing Charges. Uh, I'll talk more about intermediaries in a minute and their role in this process. But let's just look at the implications for funders. One of them is accountability. And this actually is an implication for everyone up and down the chain. But the funders especially are accountable for how the money is being spent. And not only does it mean that the, uh, the authors and the institutions are accountable to the funders for how the grant money is spent, but also funders might be responsible to other parties. Uh, keep in mind that funders could be both private and public, and so they have to assure uh, the people who are providing the money that they're handing out that if uh, an article needs to be published open access, that that's exactly what's happening. Which leads us to the issue of compliance. Uh, funders need to make sure that when they have paid uh, an open access fee, uh, that ultimately the article is being published and that it is open access and available. Another implication is split payments. We certainly have situations where multiple authors on a paper could be from different countries, could be subject to different laws, and could even be, uh, could even have different funding sources. So all of that is a consideration. Now I want to mention that on that point, I spoke with Bill O'Brien of Copyright Clearance Center, which is one of the intermediaries I'll be talking about in a minute, but I, I asked Bill about that point. You know, are the split payments really a, a, a big issue? Copyright Clearance Center has been processing open access charges for a while now. And he said in his experience, it's not as big a deal as you might think, because typically you have one corresponding author on a paper and generally you follow the rules of that author's institution. Um, and, and so far, it doesn't sound like a huge issue. 
still I have to think as open access grows and as we see more funder mandates, uh, this is something to watch. Uh, reporting could well be an issue. Uh, it remains to be seen whether funders are going to insist on getting detailed information during every step of the publication process, uh, but that's something that may emerge as, uh, as an important part of the communication channel. So reporting may well be an important implication. Optimized visibility and access, I think, is something that everyone involved in the publication process wants. Um, we want to make sure not only the articles are published and are available, but that people can find them. And also metadata. I think uh, librarians would certainly attest to the importance of metadata, as would the indexing and abstracting agencies. Um, anyone who's involved in curating, disseminating information, wants to ensure that high quality metadata is there from the beginning and that it's widely shared throughout the process. All of these have implications for open access. So let's take a look now at the second major stakeholder in the process, institutions. And you'll notice right away that some of the same implications for the funders also apply to the institutions. But let's take a look at some of those that are specific to institutions. One of the emerging models that uh, is probably going to become more common is we're seeing funders providing block grants to the institutions, and then the institution is the one actually writing the check for the, uh, the open access fees. Now, one of the things that that brings with it is the potential for institutions to join some kind of a membership scheme with publishers. Now, if an institution joins this type of arrangement, then obviously everyone wants to be able to keep track of who is a member of this and who is not, and any discounts would need to be applied accordingly. There's also authorization, which is an issue with uh, institutions, and this is an example of what could happen if uh, there's a poor authorization loop. An author submits an article, gets accepted, it's published open access, and then the institution hears about it for the first time when the invoice is issued. Uh, in order to avoid any such surprises, a lot of institutions are probably going to look at ways to make the, uh, the publication process a little more formal and make sure the lines of communication are open from the beginning. So closing that authorization loop is something they're going to have an interest in doing. And, uh, you know, as I said, some of the same implications here are going to apply to institutions, split payments, reporting, optimized visibility, and the metadata. So now I want to look at the implications for the authors. And this is a little bit different. Uh, obviously, a lot of the same conditions apply. But for authors, we particularly want to make sure that there's an awareness of the process that authors are aware of where the funding is coming from, what the rules are, and what the costs for open access are. Authors will also need a straightforward process as much as possible, and I'll talk about that later, how uh, publishers can integrate systems to try to make the process as, as streamlined as possible. Authors will also need access to information about their articles, and about payment, has it been received? Has the article been published? Is it available open access? Now let's look at implications here for the publishers, the fourth major stakeholder in the process. Integration, I uh, just alluded to, publishers have seen for years elements of their publication process become more digitized, become more automatic. Uh, but these have been happening, in some cases, in isolation. Um, figures have become digitized, production process, and now peer review systems are common uh, in electronic format. And now what we're seeing is payment systems that can integrate with those. So as all of these electronic production systems emerge and can be integrated together, that's going to streamline the process for everyone. 
We also see a number of payment options, and some institutions and some authors are going to prefer one type of payment system over another, credit cards, um, invoices, possibly PayPal, and other forms of payment may emerge in the future. Publishers also need to make sure they have established a link between the payment and the publication of open access. In the same way the funder wants to ensure compliance with the open access mandate, the publisher needs to make sure that if payment has been received, that the article is actually available open access. Credit control is another issue that, uh, as publishers collect payments, they'll want to have a handle on. Um, the report from RIN says that publishers are reporting that they devote considerable effort to chasing payments. And uh, one large publisher even reported that as many as 10 to 15 percent of invoices remain unpaid after 90 days. So this is something that publishers are going to want to pay attention to and make sure that they are chasing down as many of those payments as they can. And of course, um, split payments, reporting back to authors and institutions, all of these are implications for publishers as well. So what all of these implications do is they create a number of challenges in the open access sphere. One of the challenges is that even though some institutions have been receiving block grants to pay for open access, we really don't have a well-established best practice for managing those block grants yet. Um, institution by institution and funder by funder, uh, everyone seems to be managing it okay, but across the board, uh, a, a clear best practice has yet to emerge. Another of the challenges, as mentioned before, are the accountability and the compliance issues. Um, accountability and compliance both go up and down the chain. Everyone wants to make sure that they are doing what they say they're going to do and what they need to do based on funder mandates and that when the article is published, that it's published open access and is available. And whatever process is being used, it needs to be easy on the authors and the institutions, easy to understand, easy to implement. So among the challenges, uh, and this is from, uh, from my personal files, I work with a handful of journals here at Allen Press that charge page charges. And over the years, trying to collect those page charges, uh, we've run into a number of different issues. So just, I'm not going to go down uh, this list in great detail, but I just want to point out a couple of these. Uh, these are, these are real-world situations that we've experienced that have made it uh, difficult to collect payments in some instance. Uh, member discounts is one example. Uh, somebody says, well, wait, I'm entitled to a discount on my page charges. I'm a member. Well, someone has to verify if they're a member. Um, frequently, that's easy because Allen Press does uh, manage the membership database for some of the societies we work with, and so we can quickly check. But what happens when you check and it turns out the person is not a member? Or maybe they were a member at the time of submission, but they let their membership lapse and months later their article is now being published. Well, at what point during the process do they have to be a member to be eligible for their discount? Um, these are the types of questions that uh, are going to be a factor in this process. And then any number of other situations can arise where authors move from one institution to another. Um, I saw an example of a uh, uh, very unusual situation earlier this year, but some institutions do merge and then the name of the institution changes and all the email addresses for everyone at that institution change. It sometimes makes it hard to follow up with people. So these are all things that uh, have applied to me just in collecting page charges. And you see where collecting open access fees could be even more complicated than that. So. What we have is a very complex environment here, but there are some possible solutions to these challenges. 
And uh, again, some of this information is coming directly from the RIN report about the role of intermediaries in handling open access payments. So I want to talk about these for a minute. Uh, Copyright Clearance Center is a reproduction rights organization, and this is an example of how such a group can work with publishers and institutions to streamline the payment process. Uh, as just one example, the Copyright Clearance Center recently announced an arrangement with Ares, a uh, producer of the uh, peer review system, to integrate their operations. Now, I want to stress that this is not an exclusive arrangement. Uh, if you work with Copyright Clearance Center to process your payments, you can work with any other peer review system. Uh, and vice versa. But if you work with both Copyright Clearance and with ARIES, those systems are going to be designed to work seamlessly together and streamline the process. Uh, it's possible we'll see more of that sort of partnering going on in the industry. Uh, subscription agents are also another potential intermediary. And that makes sense because they're used to processing different types of payments. They're used to working with uh, international currencies and doing the conversion themselves. And they certainly have contacts throughout the industry. Uh, so I spoke with uh, Robert Shane Vogel at EBSCO, who said that EBSCO is launching an APC processing service within the next few weeks. So what I said before about people seeing opportunity in the world of open access, there you go. Uh, also, earlier this year, SWETS announced that uh, it has launched an open, ac uh, open access fee processing service. Uh, other types of potential intermediaries are startups. Uh, open Access Key is an example of that. Also, procurement organizations. There's one in the UK called JISC Collections, which announced earlier this year a pilot project working with open access key. So we're seeing a number of intermediaries that are stepping into uh, to this growing need for someone to be able to handle these very complex payments. So there are other possible solutions that can apply. And this is not quite so much from the payment processing aspect of things, but just in being able to track all of the information that's being passed around. Uh, Fundref is a uh, service of Crossref, which is keeping track of more than 4,000 funding organizations. It was launched earlier this year, and much of the information that's included in Fundref is uh, available for use now and can be incorporated with manuscript submission systems. So again, integration of systems is an important aspect of this. ORCID, which is a registry of unique researcher identifiers. I, I think the easiest way to understand ORCID is if you have two authors with the same name, uh, but they're obviously two different people, uh, you want a unique way of tracking those authors and what they publish and where their funding sources come from. So ORCID is an emerging new way to do that. And CHORUS is a proposed clearinghouse of open access research. And this is one response to the White House memo from earlier this year. And I think some of the details still have to be worked out, but my understanding of how CHORUS would work is that it would refer people to open access articles that are already residing on the publisher websites. So it avoids the need for a duplicative repository that's housed somewhere else. And by the end of this month, a proof of concept about Chorus is due to be released. So that's something to watch for. Pages is a Department of Energy effort that I think will work in a similar way to Chorus. It directs readers to the publisher site if the open access articles are available there. If not, it would direct them to an existing repository. Or if neither of those options are available, it would create a repository and would refer them to the site just for that purpose. 
So now that is actually in prototype mode and is up and running now. And it's possible that if Chorus is launched um, in the form that is expected, that Pages could coordinate with it. So that is a kind of a high-level view of how things stand in the open access sphere and why it can become so complicated trying to collect open access charges. But now I want to shift over to looking at some of the other types of author fees. And there are many. Uh, some of the most common are page charges, color charges, uh, alterations or figure remakes, and these are changes that authors are making on proofs of their articles. Uh, submission fees, sometimes you have uh, publication fees or acceptance fees, uh, they all kind of fall in the same category. And then there are reprints, both in print and uh, online as PDFs. So some journals are experimenting with different ways to use those fees, and they serve a number of different purposes. So let's talk a bit about effective uses for these types of fees. And one, obviously, is uh, to increase revenue and also to cover costs. So one thing you want to make sure of is that if you are using these fees to cover costs, that they're actually doing so. Uh, for example, if you're charging for color figures in print, it's worth stepping back for a minute to look at what are the costs of print. What is a 16-page black and white signature costing you? What is a color sig costing you? And are you charging enough to make up the difference? Another use for these fees is to encourage membership. And that's a case of establishing some type of a, a differential in the fee. So perhaps you have uh, page charges at one rate for non-members and at a discounted rate for members. Another effective use for these fees could be to influence author behavior. So I want to take a minute and just talk about how that can work. Let's say you have a journal with an overwhelming number of submissions and you have more articles than you can publish and so you have a growing backlog. Uh, one way to deal with that is to cut down on the length of the articles and encourage authors to write shorter. Well, aside from just making that a point in your author instructions and, and telling the authors they need to write shorter articles, you might also incorporate a fee there to try to uh, make it even more compelling for authors to, to keep their articles to a reasonable length. Uh, one way to do that would be to not charge any page charges up to a certain point. Say the ideal article link for your journal is five pages. So you can charge nothing at all for the first five pages and then $50 a page for every page after that, or some variation on that model. Uh, also encouraging authors to follow instructions and uh, if they do get carried away making a lot of changes on their proofs, uh, some publishers and some journals do charge for that, and their uh, their explanation there is, well, we we told you in the author instructions how to format your paper and what information needed to be there, and if you don't follow those guidelines, making a lot of changes later in the process can be disruptive to the production process and can slow down production of the journal, so we're going to um, impose a fee on that. So when it comes to streamlining APCs, there are a number of things that you can try to do to make this easy on everyone. When it's possible, try to get payment up front. Now that's been a challenge for page charges because obviously before an article is typeset, you don't know how many pages you're going to have. Uh, I've heard of various formulas that are used to try to convert manuscript pages to typeset pages. Um, but anyone who's used those formulas will tell you that it only takes a couple of figures or a couple of large tables to throw that formula off. Uh, it's very difficult to accurately estimate what the final charge is going to be. But there are other ways to charge authors for publication of their articles, 
and we'll talk about that in the case studies in just a minute. So when it's possible, if you can get payment up front, that streamlines it for everyone. Any system that you use should also have a plan for exceptions to the rule. It would be great if we could come up with a one-size-fits-all scheme and hold everyone to that, but it's very difficult. You saw a few slides back about the number of issues I've run into trying to collect page charges. Um, for example, let's say an author asks for a waiver of page charges. Do you have a process in place for handling those? Uh, are the publisher and the editor of the journal on the same page when it comes to how waivers are to be granted? Uh, it's worth talking about these things and establishing some clear process so that when it happens, you know how to deal with it. Also, it's worth considering working with intermediaries. Um, there are a number of groups out there that are able to process payments for you, and that could be a great option. Uh, on the downside, it's going to cost some money, obviously, uh, but on the plus side, maybe it frees your staff up to work on editorial concerns. And then integration with peer review. Uh, we just saw some examples where uh, systems are being integrated to be more efficient and streamlined, so whenever that's possible, uh, that's going to help. Uh, some peer review systems, including uh, some that Alan Press works with, have an e-commerce component so that they can take payments right through the system, and that speeds things up for everyone. So one more point I want to make about streamlining APCs is clear communication. And this is from uh, the, the Allen Press file. We have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, some journals charge authors for corrections that they're making on proofs. Uh, this can include changes that result from queries by a copy editor. And an example of when this happens is if the authors didn't include all the relevant information and in their references. Let's say they left out the dates or the page range, and the copy editor queries the author to provide that information. When the author provides that information, that's great. Now we can incorporate it in the article, but it means someone uh, has to actually go into the article and make those changes and type that information in. And again, that has an effect on the production process. So in some cases, the author is getting charged for providing that information. However, we have run into information where the article, the author thought because uh, they were being prompted to provide the information that there wouldn't be a charge. Well, what we've done is add the statement in red to communication that goes to authors that says, Excessive alterations may include changes resulting from a copy editor's query. And hopefully that will clear up some of that confusion. But uh, this is a recent change, and we haven't had a lot of feedback on it yet, so we'll see how it goes. And now I want to move on to a case study. And I want to thank Carrie Crophy with IOP Publishing, uh, who spent some time on the phone with me, and he explained how this process worked for a group that he works with, the American Astronomical Society. So AAS has four journals, and the goal here was to move these journals from the print world to the digital world, all parts of their operation. And they had been charging authors page charges, but they wanted to get away from that. The question was how to do it. When the page has been your uh, unit of measure for a long time, it can be difficult to transition that to the digital world. So what AAS did was it came up with a new unit. It invented the digital quantum. And the way this works is that every article is broken down into components and those are quantified. 350 words in an article is considered one quantum and for that, the author pays $35. The author also pays $35 each for a figure, a table, a digital component such as a movie file, or an online figure set which may contain as many as 100 figures. And then there are extra costs for uh, other types of article 
uh, handling charges uh, for errata or for printed color, there's a separate policy. But what AAS did by doing this was they were able to get around uh, the print model and move to an entirely digital model. So let's look at the benefits that AAS enjoyed from making this change. They effectively replaced the page and the change was revenue neutral for the most part for AAS. Now, as Carrie explained to me, some authors in the old model had been publishing articles that had a lot of print pages uh, and maybe they were paying a little more than their fair share for those publications. Other authors had very few print pages but a lot of online components and so maybe they weren't paying as much as the average author and this new process seems to have flattened that out and everyone seems to be paying a fair rate. The authors haven't complained at all and as Carrie explained to me, the, uh, the authors who publish in these journals are very tech savvy, they're open to change, and they understood right away uh, what happened here. Now, I should say that if you're thinking of implementing such a change with your journal and your society, it might be worth doing a quick survey or even a focus group, maybe at your annual meeting. Just test the waters and uh, compare the proposed change with what you've been doing. See if this is something that your authors would accept. But in this case, um, it seemed to have worked out very well. And maybe most importantly, AAS is now able to calculate the cost for publishing the articles uh, earlier in the process. In fact, the authors should be able to calculate the cost themselves and know even before submitting what it's going to cost them. So you might be wondering, well, what about just charging a flat rate for articles? Well, the American Geophysical Union thought the same thing and established a uh, typical rate of $500 per article in their journals. Uh, in some cases, there is a surcharge for longer articles, and that depends on the type of article. And if there are no changes or up to 10 changes, uh, there is no charge to the authors. Beyond that, there's a two-tier model. Uh, 10 to 25 changes on the proofs will cost $250. More than that will cost $750. So again, just another approach and uh, one that seems to be fair and seems to be working well for authors. So just to talk about pricing for a minute, uh, obviously pricing for all types of author fees uh, is all over the board. Uh, so when you're trying to decide how to price these things for authors, there are a number of things to do, but I think a, a process of looking at your current practices is important. Uh, and the things to look at are if the charges are intended to cover production costs, are they in fact doing that? Um, how much are we making from these charges and is, are they serving the right purpose? If you're thinking of making any changes to those charges, I would certainly take a look at what competing journals are doing. Uh, I think the authors will do that. Uh, any survey that I've seen about where authors decide to publish uh, shows that cost is usually not the number one factor, but I do think it's something authors will pay attention to. So make sure that you're not out of line with what other journals in your field are charging. If you have a multidisciplinary journal, obviously that makes things more complicated and you have to compare your journal with several other journals from other disciplines. And there may be a lot of uh, things in common with those journals, but you may have some outliers as well and you may just have to decide what your priorities are in setting those prices. As the two case studies that I just presented show, you shouldn't be afraid to try something new and unique. Um, I would accompany any change in your current model with some type of clear communication and information that the, the members of your society and your authors will understand. And if you're increasing prices, I think it's important just to make sure that everyone understands 
the importance of doing that. Uh, if you're generating revenue through your publications that are funding the operations of your society, I think it's fair to just explain that. And you may even pitch it to the, uh, the authors of your journal as we have the choice of raising member dues or of raising publication costs. Um, every journal situation is going to be unique. So just another quick word about pricing. I took a look at the 20 or so journals published here at Allen Press, and there's quite a range. Uh, page charges can go from zero to $100 per page. Um, open access fees can go to uh, as high as $4,000 and on and on. Now, uh, all of these, uh, there could be a price differential like I mentioned earlier. So in some cases, the zero fee may apply to someone uh, who's a member of the society or um, some journals just don't charge those fees. Uh, for example, there's a journal I work with that prints all color. So yes, there is a cost to printing color, but they don't pass that cost along to the authors, so they don't charge for color. Other journals typically print black and white, but if the author wants color, they could be charged up to $1,000 for that. So yes, the pricing is all over the board. Again. You have to find what works best for your journal. So the takeaways from all of this, I would say they boil down to identify all of the stakeholders and their needs, simplify your systems as much as you possibly can, do what works for your journal, and when possible, use author fees strategically to benefit your journal. Uh, we have a link to some of the resources that I used in this webinar, and there were several others, but I think these are the ones that have the details that would be most helpful, including the two case reports. And at this point, I want to turn it over to Joanna and your questions. Great. Um, thank you, Peter. There were quite a few questions that were chatted in uh, during the presentation, and of course, you are welcome to continue to send me your questions as we go through the Q&A here. Um, so, Peter, the first question that we had um, is the first couple of questions are really back to talking about open access and specifically um, kind of how open access revenue works. So the first was, which organizations are the recipients of open access revenue? Are, are publishers making money off of open access? Yes. Uh, what some publishers are finding is that uh, open access can actually represent uh, a new revenue stream in some cases. But uh, I, I want to reiterate what I said earlier. We're not sure about the long term here. And something to, to keep in mind is that if a journal makes the bulk of its revenues on subscriptions, that open access has potential to undermine that. If, uh, if you consider that at a certain point, if a journal becomes predominantly open access, imagine if you're a librarian and you have to uh, consider whether or not you're going to renew your subscription to that journal. At some point, you're going to say to yourself, well, more than half of this journal is, is open access, so why am I paying for less than half of this content? Um, that's what I mean by the long-term implications still have some shaking out to do. Uh, the other aspect of open access publication that I really didn't get into very much, uh, the mandates usually come with an embargo period. Now, I saw a survey uh, a while back that asked librarians, um, how willing are you to pay for a journal that would be open access in a year, the entire journal? And a lot of librarians said, yeah, they would continue to pay for a journal that was going to be open access in a year, but if it went any below that, they would be a little more reluctant to pay for those journals. So at this point, with the stage where we are in open access, it can represent additional revenue, but long term, I think we're all waiting to see how this works out. Right, and can you just clarify for us, Peter, the, the revenue that we're talking about comes from either an author or a funding agency actually 
paying for the article to be able to access, and that's what that revenue consists of, correct? That's exactly right. So the articles, uh, the article gets accepted, and the the author typically is going to get an invoice for the open access publication. Now, whether the author is actually the person ultimately paying that cost. Uh, is, is usually not the way this works. Usually the money is coming from an institution or a funding agency. Right. Okay. So uh, I'll just stick with, we've got a couple more questions coming in on open access, so we'll kind of stay on this topic for a minute. Um, how should publishers go about deciding what their open access fees could be? Obviously there's a concern about the loss of subscription revenue and you know what are best practices for kind of uh, replacing that with open access revenue. Sure. I think there are two main things you want to look at here. One is what other journals in your field are doing. Uh, if you work in a, a, a field where other journals are charging $1,000 per article for open access, if you want to try charging $3,000 per article, uh, that might be a tough sell and you might start losing some, some papers because of that. But another thing to look at is where is your revenue coming from and what would happen? I mean, carry the uh, the current situation through and look a few years down the road. What if your journal did become mostly open access and you did start to lose those subscriptions? Um, uh, one way to do this is to look at the number of articles you publish per year on average and how much would you have to charge for each of those articles in order to make up a total loss of not only subscription revenue, but any other aggregation or licensing revenue. And if, if all of your subscription and aggregation revenue went away, you would have to make up for that somehow, mostly through open access fees. And I think that's one way to explain why in some cases the fees are as high as they seem to be. But another thing to keep in mind is that it varies by discipline. So did I say there were two main things to keep in mind? I guess there are at least three main things to keep in mind, and probably some others I'm forgetting. But it does vary by discipline. I, I've seen a report that says that the open access fees are going to be higher in the biomedical journals, particularly those with higher impact factors. So a number of things to keep in mind there. Do you have any other tips for publishers who've never used any type of APCs, you know, what they need to do to get started in terms of communicating with authors, um, you know, in addition to kind of setting the pricing? Sure. Uh, I think, first of all, take a really close look at your financial situation. Why are you considering uh, introducing such fees? Uh, if you're having trouble with your revenue flow, are there other channels that you could be looking at that could raise revenue? Um, are you charging enough for subscriptions, for example? Um, if, you, if you look at your production costs and your revenues and you determine that you really need to start charging, I would also look at other goals you have in mind. I mentioned uh, the journals that have backlogs and they're trying to get authors to write shorter. Um, is there a way to tie these fees in to some other strategic part of your operation that you're trying to achieve. And if all of that works out and you come up with a plan, bring the authors and certainly all the other stakeholders of the journal into the conversation and make sure they understand um, why the fees are being introduced and how the journal and or society will benefit from that. Um, sometimes societies have to raise their membership dues. Sometimes journals have to increase their subscription fees. I think people understand that, but they they at least deserve some type of explanation. Um, one more question about open access. Um, typically when an author pays open access fees, do they retain the copyright for their article or does that vary? It does vary, and that's an excellent question. It, you could probably do another webinar on that. Uh, what we're seeing in a lot of cases is when an article is published open access, the, um, the copyright issue is a little different. Either the author retains the total copyright on the article, 
or it's published under some type of uh, Creative Commons license, or the journal may retain the copyright uh, as most journals do, but the author will uh, also have more rights regarding reuse of the, the article. And one thing to keep in mind is the difference here between any commercial reuse of an article and any uh, nonprofit or educational reuse. And this is a topic of debate in, in uh, the scholarly publishing community. And it's something that you, know, you can refer to any number of sources to get a variety of opinions on this. I would certainly recommend following the Scholarly Kitchen. Uh, the, the chefs in the kitchen write about this issue periodically. And uh, I think it's something that, like a lot of things that apply to open access, we just haven't seen a clear uh, best practice emerge yet. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um so let's kind of move on and talk a little bit about some of the some of the um, APCs that are not necessarily related to open access. Um, first, we wanted just a clarification of submission fees versus publication fees. And when we talk about submission fees, are we talking about you know when the paper is submitted, it's not necessarily guaranteed publication? Exactly, and I've heard a very good justification for that type of fee. You know, even when an author submits an article and it's rejected that author has essentially used some of the journal's resources. Um, somebody had to review the paper, an editor or an associate editor has had to devote some time to the paper. Um, so I think it's fair to say that even the rejected papers are using up some of the journal's resources, so it's fair to, in some cases, charge those authors. Uh, and, and if you think of the total amount that you're trying to raise for the journal through these fees, if you charge an acceptance fee or a production fee that only applies to the accepted articles, it's going to be higher than if you divide the same amount by all of the articles that are submitted to the journal. Maybe uh, a, a smaller fee that applies to everyone who submits is going to be easier to take than a larger fee that only applies to the accepted articles. Mm -hmm. So that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, and in some cases I think we've even seen where a publisher will charge a submission fee and a publication fee, um, and so you know maybe they're doing both, or maybe uh, we've also seen where a publisher charges a submission fee, but then if you get accepted, um, that gets that gets added into your publication fees, so your publication fees are going to be a little bit less. So we've seen that happen um, a couple of different ways. And it can also really help to um, weed out inappropriate submissions. Someone just qu um, questioned, you know, what about papers that are rejected before review? Um, and yeah, you'd still be charging those. Hopefully, if you are rejecting a lot of papers because they're inappropriate for your journal, um, you know, charging a, a little bit of a fee can kind of help discourage people from sending, you know, whatever they hope will stick. <laughs> right, hope springs eternal, right? But <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's an excellent point uh, because you 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 don't want anyone to waste anyone else's time, and uh, certainly there are no guarantees about whether an article is going to be published or not. But if you can discourage the um, the ones who really are just sending it in on a wing and a prayer, uh, maybe that would save uh, a little time and trouble. Yeah. So um, if collecting fees is a, is a problem, uh, would you recommend that it's a good policy to try and collect fees prior to publication? I would. Uh, and, and that might even be a reason to shift the types of fees that you're charging. Uh, if you've been charging after publication and you're having a hard time chasing those down, Sure, uh, change the nature of the fee, and you know if you're if you're not making as much money as you should because you're not collecting those fees, then you might be able to charge a fair amount earlier in the process. But if you can collect 100% of those, 
even if it's less than you would ideally be charging at the end of the process, you're going to come out ahead in most cases. So, yes, if you can charge earlier in the process, I think that's better for everyone. And keep in mind that whether you're using some type of intermediary or you're managing those invoices yourself, um, there is a cost every time you send out an invoice. And if you're following up with somebody three, four, five times, someone has to be involved in that. Um, here at Allen Press, we work with a number of journals, and we handle the author billing for them. And that's one of the things we try to keep in mind is how much staff time and how many resources are we devoting to, in some cases, trying to capture a small amount of revenue. So anytime you can shift that to earlier in the process, you're going to come out ahead. So um, on that note, we did have a couple of people um, post questions about services that Allen Press offers to help you um, with author payments. If you're using um, Allen Track or Pure Track, there is, um, as, as Peter mentioned, e-commerce capability in those systems. So um, if that's something that you'd be interested in turning on, you can certainly contact your account manager uh, or your business development director to talk about that. Um, and then we do also have author billing services that are uh, more of a manual sort of after after publication type um, type fee. So uh, it looks like that is all the questions that we have for today. Um, really great discussion. I appreciate everybody's uh, participation. So I want to thank Peter and all of our attendees. I hope that you all enjoyed the presentation and that you're taking away some ideas for how you might streamline your own policies and procedures um, as they regard APCs. We will be sending out a brief survey that will include links to both the slides and a video recording of today's session. So please do take a few minutes to complete the survey. We're always looking for feedback on how we can improve future webinars and suggestions for future topics. And of course, don't forget, you can continue the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. The Twitter hashtag again is APWeb25. That concludes our session for today. Thanks very much for attending.